The murder of Mary Kelly took place in her room at 13 Millers Court off Dorset Street in Spitalfields on Friday the 9th of November, 1888. According to Dr Thomas Bond, her death had taken place between 1 and 2 o'clock that morning, although two of her neighbours later stated that they had heard a faint cry of murder at around 4 a.m., suggesting that the murder could have occurred a few hours later than Bond's estimate. In the days that followed, various witnesses came forward to claim that they had seen Mary about the streets and in the pubs of Spitalfields in the hours leading up to her murder, and several, such as Caroline Maxwell, even claimed that they had met her very much alive in the hours after the supposed time of her death. The majority of these were interviewed by Inspector Aberline on the day of the murder, in preparation for them being called to give evidence at the inquest into her death and they all dutifully appeared at the inquest, which began at Shoreditch Town Hall on the morning of Monday the 12th of November, with Coroner Roderick MacDonald presiding. Interestingly, unlike Coroner Wynne Edwin Baxter, who had presided over the previous inquests into the deaths of Mary Nichols, Annie Chapman and Elizabeth Stride, and who stretched the proceedings out over several weeks, MacDonald concluded Mary Kelly's inquest that same day, and thus the jury returned their verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown on the afternoon of the 12th. The Times commented on the evident haste of the inquest in its edition of Tuesday the 13th of November. Some surprise was created among those present at the abrupt termination of the inquiry, as it was well known that further evidence would be forthcoming. As a result of the speedy conclusion, an important witness who may have seen Mary Kelly with her killer around the time that her murder took place wasn't called to give evidence and was not therefore subjected to the scrutiny and questioning that would have helped establish the veracity of what he claimed to have seen. That witness was George Hutchinson, who walked into Commercial Street Police Station at six o'clock on the evening of Monday the 12th to say that he had met Mary Kelly here on Commercial Street in the early hours of Friday the 9th of November. Just to give some context to his statement, it featured four locations along Commercial Street. These were Thrall Street, Flower and Dean Street, Fashion Street and Dorset Street. All these thoroughfares belonged to a section of the district that was known as the Wicked or Evil Quarter Mile, on account of the crime and vice that was prevalent in this unsalubrious enclave. To be honest, we know very little about George Hutchinson. The Times described him as a man, apparently of the labouring class, with a military appearance. According to an article which appeared in various newspapers on the 14th of November, the original source of which was the Central News Agency, Hutchinson had formerly been a groom but was now a labourer, although in a report dated the 12th of November, Inspector Aberline stated that he was in no regular employment. It would therefore appear that Hutchinson was a casual labourer who took employment as and when he could get it. Hutchinson lodged at the Victoria Home for Working Men, a former warehouse located at 39-41 to Commercial Street, which had been converted to a hostel the previous year and which styled itself as an expression of practical Christianity with the stated aim of providing a better class of accommodation than common lodging houses for respectable men. The home charged fourpence a night or two shillings a week for a single bed or sixpence a night or three shillings a week for a cabin. Strict rules had to be adhered to to deter bad characters, one of which was that nobody would be admitted after one o'clock in the morning. On Thursday the 8th of November, Hutchinson had gone to Romford in Essex and had set off to walk the 17 or so miles back that evening, arriving in Whitechapel in the early hours of Friday the 9th. As he made his way along Whitechapel Road, he glanced up at the clock of St Mary's Church and saw that the time was between 10 to and 5 to 2. He continued on to Whitechapel High Street, turned right along Commercial Street and began walking along its right side. Crossing its junction with Thrall Street, he passed a man standing on the corner. As he walked towards Flower and Dean Street, he met Mary Kelly, who, so he later told the reporter from the Central News, he knew very well, having been in her company a number of times. Kelly did not seem to me to be drunk, he later recalled, but was a little bit spreeish.
She asked him if he could lend her sixpence, but he told her that he couldn't because he was spent out going down to Romford. "'I must go and look for some money,' was her reply, and so saying she headed towards Thrall Street, whereupon the man who was standing on its corner walked towards her and put his hand on her shoulder. The man said something to Mary, although Hutchinson couldn't hear what it was, and the two of them burst out laughing. In his police statement given to Inspector Aberline on the 12th of November, Hutchinson said that he then heard Mary say, "'All right,' to which the man replied, "'You will be all right for what I have told you.' The man again put his hand on Mary's shoulder, and they began walking slowly in Hutchinson's direction. Hutchinson continued to the corner of Fashion Street, where he paused outside the Queen's Head pub. My suspicions were aroused by seeing the man so well dressed, he told the Central News reporter. The couple came towards him, the man's hand still on Mary's shoulder. He had a soft felt hat on, Hutchinson later recollected, and this was drawn down somewhat over his eyes. I put down my head to look him in the face, and he turned and looked at me very sternly, and they walked across the road to Dorset Street. Hutchinson followed, pausing on the corner of Dorset Street, by which time Mary and the man had reached the entrance to Miller's Court, where they stood chatting for around three minutes. The man said something to Mary, but Hutchinson couldn't hear what it was, although he did hear Mary reply, All right, my dear, come along, you'll be comfortable. The man then placed his arm on her shoulder and gave her a kiss. Kelly spoke to the man in a loud voice, Hutchinson continued in his statement to the Central News reporter, saying, I have lost my handkerchief. He pulled a red handkerchief out of his pocket and gave it to Kelly. They both then went up the court together. I went to look up the court to see if I could see them, but I could not. I stood there for three quarters of an hour to see if they came down again, but they did not, and so I went away. In his Central News interview, Hutchinson observed that The man I saw did not look as though he would attack another one. He carried a small parcel in his hand, about eight inches long, and it had a strap round it. He had it tightly grasped in his left hand. It looked as though it was covered with dark American cloth. He carried in his right hand, which he had upon the woman's shoulder, a pair of brown kid gloves. One thing I noticed, and that was that he walked very softly. I believe that he lives in the neighbourhood, and I fancied that I saw him in Petticoat Lane on Sunday morning, but I was not certain. Hutchinson then went on to give an amazingly detailed description of the man. He was about five foot six inches in height, and thirty-four or thirty-five years of age, with a dark complexion and dark moustache turned up at the ends. He was wearing a long coat trimmed with astrakhan, a white collar with black necktie, in which was affixed a horseshoe pin. He wore a pair of dark spats with light buttons over buttoned boots and displayed from his waistcoat a massive gold chain. His watch chain had a big seal with a red stone hanging from it. He had a heavy moustache, curled tip and dark eyes and bushy eyebrows. He had no side whiskers and his chin was clean shaven. He looked like a foreigner. I could swear to the man anywhere. The description of the man that Hutchinson gave to Abilene was more or less the same, with the notable exception that, whereas he was quoted in the newspapers as saying that the man looked like a foreigner, he told Abilene that he had been of Jewish appearance. It is likely that the Central News changed this, probably at the request of the police, in order to prevent a possible repeat of the anti-Semitism that had broken out in the aftermath of Annie Chapman's murder. By the time Hutchinson left Miller's Court, the nearby clock of Christchurch Spitalfields was striking three, and since he had missed the 1am curfew at the Victoria home, he walked the streets for the rest of the night, going into the home as soon as it opened on the Friday morning. One of the first red flags about George Hutchinson is why it took him three days to come forward. The Victoria home was less than five minutes' walk from Dorset Street and Hutchinson, so he claimed, had known Mary Kelly for three years. So it is something of a mystery as to why it took him so long to come forward to impart his seemingly important information, especially since he could not have not known about the murder and that the victim was Mary Kelly. He did tell the Central News reporter that on the Sunday morning he had told one policeman what he had seen, but he didn't go to the police station 
until he mentioned it to a fellow lodger at the Victoria home on the Monday, and that lodger had advised him to go to the police, which he did that night. Hutchinson's statement wasn't made public until the afternoon of Tuesday the 13th of November, so it didn't appear in the press until the morning of Wednesday the 14th. The morning papers of that day were unanimous that Hutchinson was an important witness. The description of the murderer given by Hutchinson, the Morning Herald informed readers, agrees in every particular with that already furnished to the police and published yesterday morning. There is not the slightest reason to doubt Hutchinson's veracity, and it may be confidently asserted, therefore, that the police are in possession of an absolutely reliable description of the murderer. However, by that evening, at least one newspaper was starting to doubt Hutchinson. The Echo, in its Wednesday evening edition, remarked that, Unfortunately for the theories of our morning contemporaries, we learnt on inquiry at the Commercial Street Police Station today that the elaborate description is virtually the same as that previously published. It is a little fuller, that is all, but it proceeds from the same source. The police do not attach so much importance to this document as some of our contemporaries do, but they think it sufficiently significant to induce them to make it the subject of careful inquiry. Whether it will result in affording a clue to the Whitechapel mystery is more than can be conjectured at present. Against this, it should be noted that the extremely experienced Inspector Abeline appears to have believed Hutchinson, even going so far as to describe his statement as important in his report, and observing that, having interrogated him, he was of the opinion that Hutchinson was telling the truth. Indeed, so seriously were Hutchinson's claims taken that in his report of the 12th, Abeline averred that arrangement was at once made for two officers to accompany him round the district for a few hours tonight with a view of finding the man if possible. On the morning of Tuesday the 13th, Hutchinson was taken to the mortuary, where, so he later told the Central News reporter, I recognised the body as being that of the woman Kelly whom I saw at two o'clock on Friday morning. So Hutchinson was clearly being taken seriously on the Monday and Tuesday after the murder, and the Morning Herald on Friday the 16th of November reported that the detectives were relying almost exclusively upon Hutchinson's description of the murderer. That Hutchinson had been standing at Miller's Court at the time he said he was, was independently confirmed by another witness. Sarah Lewis, a laundress of 24 Great Pearl Street, Spitalfields, was friendly with Mrs. Keeler, who lived at No. 2 Miller's Court, located on the left of the first floor. In the early hours of the 9th of November, Sarah had had words with her husband and had stormed out, intending to stay with her friend, Mrs. Keeler. On approaching Dorset Street, Sarah had looked up at the clock of Christchurch and had seen that it was half-past two. Making her way along Dorset Street, she turned right into Miller's Court, and, as she did so, she noticed a man standing on the opposite side of the street. He was not tall, but stout, she told the inquest, and he had on a wide-awake black hat. I did not notice his clothes. He was looking up the court, as if waiting for someone to come out. Sarah Lewis had given her inquest testimony by the time George Hutchinson came forward on the Monday night but her evidence corroborated Hutchinson's claim that he had waited at Miller's court for 45 minutes. So that part of what he said was certainly verifiable. And yet, Hutchinson's claims have set alarm bells ringing with students of the case, many of them observing that what the Echo termed his elaborate description was simply too detailed to be considered accurate. Other than that brief moment when Mary Kelly and the man passed him at the junction of Fashion Street, Hutchinson was watching from some distance, yet several days later he was able to recall and describe such minute details as the man's bushy eyebrows and the horseshoe pin on his necktie. Commentators also question whether such a well-dressed man would have dared venture into such an infamous enclave as the Wicked Quarter Mile at such an early hour of the morning, let alone do so openly displaying a massive gold watch chain with a big seal and a red stone hanging from it. People were mugged for far less, in and around the streets that Hutchinson claimed to have seen the man on, and this has led some to suggest that the man was a figment of Hutchinson's imagination invented by him for reasons that can now only be guessed at. 
some hold that Hutchinson was an attention seeker who, having heard or read the descriptions of the murderer, decided to inject himself into the investigation by coming up with an elaborate yarn with which he was able to hoodwink the police and the press, possibly in the hope of some financial remuneration. This possibility was raised by an American newspaper, The Wheeling Register, in an article headlined About Whitechapel, although the newspaper didn't reveal its source. Some clever individual, having invented a detailed description of the man seen walking about with Mary Kelly just before she was murdered, has been hired at five times his usual salary to walk about with the police and try to see the man again. So doubts were certainly being entertained about Hutchinson at the time and still continue to be expressed about him today. However, we can't dismiss him outright because Abilene appears to have trusted what he said and Abilene, as an experienced police officer, would no doubt have entertained similar reservations to those expressed by modern-day pundits. Of course, although we know that Abilene believed Hutchinson when he compiled his report on the 12th of November, we don't know whether he continued to do so over the days that followed, and it is noticeable that Hutchinson's name doesn't appear in official records after that initial report on the 12th. But then again, Sarah Lewis corroborated the fact that he was standing outside Miller's court at between 2 and 3 o'clock on the morning of the murder, just as he said he had been. So the fact remains that Hutchinson may well have seen a man with Mary Kelly, and that man did go with Mary to her room. If the man was the murderer, and things did unfold in the way that Hutchinson said they did, then the man was taking an almighty risk. He would have been aware that he had been seen, so he must have been extremely cool and calculating to have carried out the murder in the full knowledge that there was a witness who could identify him. But if the man wasn't the murderer, then what was he doing in the neighbourhood at that time? A possible explanation was provided by the Toronto Daily Mail on the 19th of November. Over the past few weeks, the old mania for slumming in Whitechapel has become fashionable again. Every night, scores of young men who have never been in the East End before in their lives prowl around the neighbourhood in which the murders were committed, talking with the frightened women and pushing their way into overcrowded lodging houses. So it is feasible that, if he did exist, the man was simply enjoying a spot of dark tourism and was slumming in the East End, albeit he was still placing himself in grave danger, wandering round the area with his valuables so openly on display. But we are still left with the problem of Hutchinson's description of the man being what one commentator has described as ridiculously detailed. It might just be that George Hutchinson was a man who enjoyed the gift of perfect recall and who was blessed with powers of observation that would put Sherlock Holmes to shame. Admittedly, that is unlikely, but there are other explanations that we might consider. For example, did Hutchinson, realising that he had been the last person to see Mary Kelly alive, feel that he might be accused of her murder and invent the man or exaggerate his description of him in order to divert suspicion away from himself? The reality, though, is that he had no actual need to come forward, since almost every detail of his encounter came from him. The only person who remembered seeing him that morning was Sarah Lewis, and she only caught a brief glimpse of him as she turned into Miller's court. Indeed, she told Abilene that she wouldn't be able to identify the man she had seen. But even then, that would only place him in Dorset Street, and neither Sarah Lewis, nor any other witness for that matter, spoke of having seen Hutchinson, speaking with, or being anywhere near Mary Kelly, on the morning of the murder. So there was no danger of any witness, with the obvious exception of the man he claimed to have seen, placing Hutchinson at the scene of the crime, or even in the vicinity of it. So why would he have come forward, other than that, as an honest and upstanding citizen, he felt it his moral and civic duty to do so. It has been postulated that, up until Sarah Lewis gave her inquest testimony on the 12th of November, Hutchinson had no intention of coming forward. But when her evidence was reported in the evening newspapers that day, he may have read the accounts of it, and realising that he was the man she had seen, he decided to go to the police in order to give a reason for his being there. This would explain his delay in coming forward, since up until the afternoon of the 12th there was no public mention of a man seen watching Miller's court. 
Of course, this is little more than speculation. The truth is, we don't know for certain if George Hutchinson really did meet Mary Kelly on Commercial Street that morning, nor whether he actually knew her. If he had, as he said, been acquainted with her for three years, then that would mean that he had known her before she came to the East End, yet none of Mary's friends made any mention of him. It is plausible that he had been a client of hers. After all, he told Abeline that he had occasionally given her a few shillings, and the Central News quoted him as saying that he knew Mary Kelly very well, having been in her company a number of times. So it wouldn't be inconceivable that the relationship between them was a professional one. Perhaps, having not got back from Romford until after the 1am curfew at the Victoria home, Hutchinson had resigned himself to traipsing the streets until its doors reopened later that morning. But then his hopes were raised when he met Mary Kelly on Commercial Street. Her request for sixpence may have been a solicitation, but since he had no money, she walked on and met with the well-dressed man. Hutchinson had then followed them in the hope that, when the man left, he would be able to persuade Mary to allow him to at least spend the night in her room. But after forty-five minutes, he had got fed up and had left. There is also the possibility that Hutchinson had intended to mug the man when he left, something he wouldn't have been likely to confess to later, although that leaves the possibility that Hutchinson was unwittingly planning to mug Jack the Ripper. There is, however, another possibility, and that is that George Hutchinson, far from being an innocent bystander, was in fact the man who murdered Mary Kelly and was therefore Jack the Ripper. He was, after all, seen by a witness lingering and acting suspiciously at the scene of a murder at around the time that that murder took place. So how viable is George Hutchinson as a suspect and what is the case against him? Firstly, we actually know very little about him, other than what is disclosed in his police statement and by the brief flurry of press coverage that followed his coming forward on the evening of the 12th of November. Despite strenuous attempts to trace and identify him, no one has, as yet, succeeded in doing so with any degree of certainty. In fact, we don't even know for certain that George Hutchinson was his real name. He may have used an alias to throw the police off his trail, should they ever decide to come looking for him. However, within days of his coming forward, a bizarre coincidence occurred. As mentioned, his statement was given a huge amount of press coverage, not only in England, but also in America. Evidently, a few American newspapers felt that there was a ring of familiarity about his name, and on Saturday the 17th of November, several of them broke a story that was also picked up by some of their British counterparts. Under the headline, The White Chapel Butcher, the Wichita Eagle, informed readers that an inter-ocean special from Elgin, Illinois says, Cable dispatches of yesterday connected with the Whitechapel murders a man named George Hutchinson. The name suggests something that may or may not be important in connection with the awful butcheries. Six or seven years ago, a man named George Hutchinson was a patient in the Elgin Hospital for the Insane. He was not considered dangerous and when convalescent was allowed a good deal of liberty. At such times he was very fond of visiting the asylum slaughterhouse and became a very skillful maker of toothpicks and other articles from bones of animals, and he made a study of slaughtering. He escaped from the hospital and later turned up at the Kankakee Hospital. He also escaped or was discharged from that institution and later murdered in Chicago a woman of low repute of the same class to which belonged the victims of the Whitechapel ghoul. Hutchinson was arrested, found to be insane, and returned to Kankakee. Again, he made his escape, and for about four years has been at large. The suggestion that George Hutchinson, whose name was plastered all over the papers in England, might be an escaped American lunatic turned murderer was looked into by journalists on that side of the Atlantic, and one even went so far as to approach the Chicago Police Department for clarification. The next day, the Eagle was able to set the record straight. A sensational story was printed this morning from Elgin, Illinois, tending to connect a crazy man named George Hutchinson with the London Whitechapel butcheries which have horrified the world. 
The detectives of the Chicago Police Department have no knowledge of the perpetration of a crime such as the one described and have no record or photograph of a man named George Hutchinson. Lieutenant Elliot, when seen this morning, said, I don't think there can be anything in the story. I do not remember any such case or any record of it. There is no picture in the Rose Gallery to my knowledge of any man named Hutchinson, and I never heard of any murder under the circumstances named. However, if there is any truth in the story, it might prove a good clue to the identity of the Whitechapel murderer. We will look it up. Notwithstanding attempts by several newspapers to link the American George Hutchinson to the George Hutchinson who gave the statement in the aftermath of Mary Kelly's murder, one would think that a detective of Abilene's calibre would have spotted an American accent whilst interviewing him, so it is unlikely that they were one and the same person. The evidence put forward to incriminate the English George Hutchinson depends largely on the fact that his description of the man he saw was simply too detailed to be taken seriously, and thus it is argued that it is false and his statement a lie dreamt up to provide him with a valid excuse for being in the vicinity of Miller's court around the time of the murder, once Sarah Lewis's inquest testimony had been made public and he knew that there was a risk that he would be identified. There is also the fact that the Victoria home was located on the southwest corner of the junction of Commercial Street and Wentworth Street, a stone's throw from Flower and Dean Street, which, according to several modern-day geographical profiles, was the street in which Jack the Ripper lived. As one author has put it, all I can say is that of all the suspects named thus far, he is the only one I can accept. He fitted the properties of our killer, lived close to the epicentre of the crimes, knew the area well, and certainly knew Mary Kelly. Of course, you've probably noticed that I have not put forward any evidence to suggest that he was responsible for the other murders, and the reason for that is, there isn't any. As with several other suspects, he can be connected to one of the murders, but there is absolutely nothing to link him to any of the others other than conjecture, speculation and invention. Hutchinson genuinely had no reason to come forward, and when he did so, there was no need for him to let on that he had known Mary Kelly and that he had spoken to her on Commercial Street on the morning of her murder. He only needed to explain his presence in Dorset Street that morning. Sarah Lewis also told the inquest that, as she was making her way to Miller's court, she had seen a man with a female in Commercial Street close to Mr. Ringer's public house, a reference to the Britannia on the corner of Dorset Street. She had, she said, seen the man on the Wednesday night prior to the murder, when she was walking along Bethnal Green Road with another female. He had asked them to go down a passage with him, whereupon he set down the black bag he was carrying, undid his coat, and felt for something. This terrified her and the other woman, and they had run away. On passing the same man in the company of a woman on Commercial Street as she made her way to Mrs. Keeler's, she had looked back at him, and had looked again when she got to the corner of Dorset Street. Interestingly, she was also able to give a very detailed description of this particular man, and she told the inquest that she would be able to identify him if she were to see him again but she told the police that she could not describe the man she had seen at Miller's court, so Hutchinson had no reason to think that he would be identified by her, and yet he still came forward to provide information that could have implicated him in Mary Kelly's murder. The only three real possibilities that explain his actions, other than his having been the murderer, are a. Everything he said happened actually did happen, and he was telling the truth, b. He exaggerated his description of the man for fear of incriminating himself, or c. He was an attention seeker who saw and took the opportunity of a few days in the spotlight and the chance of a nice payoff for his efforts. There is, though, a final irony about George Hutchinson. Mary Kelly is the most elusive of Jack the Ripper's victims and the one about whom we know the least. We don't even know for certain that her name was Mary Kelly, as no one has ever been able to trace any official records of her. Likewise, George Hutchinson is one of the most elusive witnesses. We don't know for certain that his name was George Hutchinson, as no one has ever traced him or unearthed any official records that might help identify him. 
He is simply one of many parts of the puzzle that, having turned up in the case, remained in the spotlight for a brief period of time and then faded from the historical record, leaving a void that many theorists have since tried to fill with conjecture and supposition. And at that, dear viewer, I think I will leave it, as I've managed to give myself an almighty headache. How viable do you think George Hutchinson is as a suspect? Let me know in the comments section below. Oh, and uh, thanks for watching.